So next I want to touch on the Endangered Species Act. So this is um, not a traditional conservation biology approach uh, per se, not, not a biological approach, but it's, it's really, really fundamental to many of our conservation efforts um, in the United States. And so you guys should all have at least a, a generic uh, broad-based understanding of the Endangered Species Act. We've already read a little bit, a uh, little bit of this um, in, in some of our previous readings, but I wanted to make sure that it's such an important um, piece of uh, legislation and, and policy and all this and that. We, we really want to make sure we, we touch on this before we wrap the semester up. So let's talk about the Endangered Species Act. So we'll talk about a couple things here. We'll talk about is it an effective conservation tool? Um, and then just some sort of general things, maybe is there some ideas, maybe how we can improve it? And could we, um, you know, people like me always say, oh, endangered species, we should probably have an endangered populations or endangered communities act. That um, probably won't happen, but um, it would be nice if we had something like that. So let's, let's talk about the, the context, the background, the stage um, that, that produced the Endangered Species Act in the first place. And so um, basically endangered species are oftentimes iconic. So anybody know who this guy is here? But what species this is? This is a really famous... Red crested woodpecker. No, it's an ivory-billed woodpecker. So this is a woodpecker in the Gulf South and really, really iconic. It was a, first, it was a very large, you know, relatively large woodpecker, larger than our acorn woodpeckers, for example, that we have here um, around us. And look how big it, this guy's sitting on this, uh, this guy's hat uh, back in the day, almost 100 years ago. And, um, and uh, very, was very common throughout the, the swamps of Louisiana, Arkansas, uh, that, that part of the country, and essentially disappeared, right? And we thought it was gone, and we assumed it was extinct. And then the last uh, uh, 20 years, people have claimed they've seen this bird. And it's become the subject of a huge amount of interest. Scientific expeditions into these bottomland hardwood forests and these swamps and things uh, looking for this bird. And some people claim they've, they've got evidence of it in a blurry photograph. It's just like Bigfoot, right? It's like oh my God, I think I see it, and can't you tell? But if you look, if you squint and you look, and some people swear that, that that's not it, and other people swear that it is, uh, so on and so forth. Um, the point is, these, these, these rare things are iconic. And indeed, this is, um, this is a huge tourist draw for uh, these communities um, in Arkansas, uh, around the sort of remnant area where people say they made it, may have seen a, a remnant individual or two. Um, and uh, this is a huge tourist drop for birders. So for bird nerds coming on in, to start trying to see if they can see this, this rare, um, maybe almost gone bird, and this is the menu. And, and uh, after Hurricane Katrina, some friends and I, when we were back in Louisiana, we went on an on a ivory build expedition. We didn't find it, shocker, shocker, we didn't find it. But, but these endangered species are really iconic. Um, that's the story we want to avoid. We don't want to have all these people running to somewhere to see the last thing or see the last pair, right? We want to avoid that. When we start getting to a problem, let's, let's uh, uh, respond before we're, we're, we're falling off the cliff is the basic idea. The history of different um, federal policy that we've enacted to try to do this has come in many forms. The first thing was the Lacey Act, 1900, and that restricted the trade of uh, rare animal parts, skins, feathers, things of that nature, eggs, um, across state lines. So the, the, you, might, you might have heard of this when people like are doing like cigarettes or pornography or other things. Right? Once they go across state lines, it ceases to become a state problem and it becomes a, a federal problem. So that triggers the federal laws. And so that's essentially what the Lacey Act was, was doing. Um, we then get our first, um, uh, first federal uh, chunk of, uh, first piece of land set aside by the feds specifically for the cultivation, for the encouragement, for the support, for the protection of rare critters with Pelican Island um, in 1903. The next big thing we have is the um, uh, 1918 Migratory Bird Treaty Act. 
And this is for birds that fly between Mexico, the United States, and or Canada. Any two of those countries, um, or all three, um, if a bird migrates, uh, its, its migratory path crosses uh, more than one of those countries, uh, it then is listed as a species of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act and it gains extra protection. So I have the, the dubious distinction of people sued or said they were going to sue me. They actually never fully went through with the lawsuit. But they were going to sue me for some ecological restorations I was doing a couple decades ago um, to try to get rid of invasive plants. We had red-winged blackbirds, which are a very common species. We would not call these endangered now. It's, it's, a, it's a very, very common wetland and, and sort of around here. Uh, uh, species, very pretty species, very, very easy to identify, very loud, very boisterous species. Um, I was mowing down invasive weeds before they set even more seeds and some people got angry with me and they thought I should leave the weeds uh, because in doing the weeds I, I you know, flushed some red-winged blackbirds and they were like, oh my god, you violated this federal law, we're suing you. And I was like, wait, what, really? So I had to go talk to the, the Stanford and was like, hey, I think we're getting sued. I'm like, who's suing you? I'm like, what? I'm like, oh my God, did you like kill a bird? I'm like, no. You, did you do a bald eagle or did you hit like a clapper rail or something? I'm like, no. And they're like, and they're like what'd you do? And it was red winged blackbird. And they're like, are you kidding me? I'm like, yeah. And they said, how'd that be? How, how could that happen? I said, because they're on the migratory, they're listed as a species protected under the Migratory Bird, uh, migratory bird Treaty. Um, uh, our, our national bird, uh, the bald eagle, gets its own protection in 1940 um, in areas where it's becoming more rare and it, it gains, um, or, which are endangered species like protections, but specifically just for that one bird. Um, then we introduce in 1964, the, the, uh, with the National Wilderness Act, this idea of wilderness, the, the, the network of, of less disturbed places. So these are not national parks. These are not national forests. These are things that are set aside that we're not supposed to do anything to, right? And those, were a, th those have been a big help to certain species that were becoming rare. Um, uh, as we saw earlier when we talked about some of our cr critters and interactions, sometimes we have a national park, people are like, oh, let me go up and take a picture of the reproducing bull uh, moose, you know, and like, oh, yeah, no. So the wilderness uh, areas are, again, uh, more like uh, biological reserves in a sense. <clears throat> Okay, then we get to the 60s, and now the, now the momentum's really picking up. People are saying, hey, we got to do something. We have Rachel Carson, DDT, all this awareness. We're really worried about stuff. And so we have the first generation of what's called the Red Book by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And that Red Book um, is going to be essentially like an endangered species list. The very first version, 1964, lists 63 species, and these are critters that are becoming very scarce or in danger of winking out on the planet. Um, then we get the first, um, uh, the first version of the Endangered Species Act formally. It's called the Endangered Species Preservation Act of 1966 um, that, that, that sort of takes this red book list you know, a, a little bit more um, sophisticatedly. 1968, we get the first land set aside in particular, um, the National Key Deer, uh, 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 it's a key in Florida for these key deer, these little sort of pygmy deer uh, set aside, um, that's pretty large, um, for the recovery of what we would now call an endangered species specifically, um, and, and that one species in particular. Um, uh, then we introduced the Endangered Species Conservation Act, and we're starting to add things in here. Then the military gets PO'd and they push back. And they say, no, 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 no. You guys are starting to list whales, which are, which populations are, whose populations are crashing at the time. Uh, and they say, no, 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 no. We need to be able to still hunt sperm whales because the spermaceti oil in the, in the head of sperm whales is the finest natural oil we've ever found. And the, this is the middle of the Cold War. We're sending up all these satellites out into space, and part of those, satelli those satellites are trying to photograph Soviet missile silos and all this kind of Cold War spy crap. 
Um, and so these satellites really need to know where they are at any one given point in time over the planet. And so they use gyroscopes. So gyroscopes are these complex spinning devices that have multiple moving parts that, that spin around each other. And there's potentially a lot of friction. So we put this really, really fine oil in there so that the, the spinning gears are lubricated. And so essentially the, the, uh, the Pentagon says, hey, this is a national security thing. And you're passing a law that we can't kill these whales? No way. Um, now we have synthetic oil that works as well, and, and that's what we use now. We don't use whale oil in our satellites anymore. But at the time, uh, you know, 50 years ago, they're like, wait a second. 1971, we see the Wild Free Roaming Horses and Burrows Act, um, which is to try to help these uh, uh, primarily driven by, by um, uh, fencing and habitat loss, um, the, the wild uh, uh, equines uh, in the southwestern U.S. And then we get the 1972 Marine Mammal Protection Act, which is very, very powerful. This protects any marine, ma any mammal that touches the salt water. So mostly here we're talking whales and dolphins, but also it includes otters. It also includes polar bears. Um, and, and this is, um, a, a, it's proved a very successful a tool, indeed so successful, the populations have bounced back fantastically well, and that's why earlier you guys were asking about, wait, you mean fishermen actually shoot these seals in the head? Yes, because because they've their, their populations have recovered so much, and we're not allowed to harass them, and so they become quite bold. If we shot them frequently, they'd be like more like, whoa, stay away from that fishing boat, but they know that essentially we, they can just, you can't hurt me, I can come up here and, and grab your fish kind of thing. So the Marine Mammal Protection Act, very, very powerful. And that takes us up to the 1973 Endangered Species Act. Um, so it starts the year before with an executive order. Remember, the president can, can issue any executive order he or she wishes, but that's only as good as, as he or she is in office and or the predecessors don't reverse it. And so this, this uh, starts off, and this was uh, President Nixon says, um, uh, even the most recent act to protect endangered species, which dates from only 1969, simply does not provide the kind of management tools needed to act early enough to save a vanishing species. And so, um, really, all this used, all this, all this was used for, prim basically, was to stop poisoning wolves and coyotes on federal lands, not. On all lands, just lands controlled by the federal government. So think Fish and Wildlife Service, think National Park, that kind of stuff. Um, and so then with that impetus, uh, the legislature, which still functioned fairly well as a legislature, um, unlike sometimes how it functions today, um, people got together from different sides of the aisle. They came together and said, hey, how can we do this? They had a couple different versions of the bill. It went through. Finally, we get the... The, the ultimate version that, that uh, we, we settle on, and that uh, gets huge support by the end of 1973. It passes the House easily 390 to 12. Think of the last time something passed uh, that, uh, that much, and then there was 31 abstentions. Um, and it passed the Senate unanimously because eight folks, rather than vote no, they abstained. So I'll say it again, it passed the U.S. Senate unanimously, unanimously. This was a different era, right? Um, and supporters include people that later on maybe you would not associate with endangered species protections. Folks like Bob Dole, the, the, the eventual presidential candidate, Jesse Helms, known for... Um, stuff the South is known for. Um, uh, and uh, Ted Stevens from Alaska, not a huge uh, lover of endangered species, big advocate of oil drilling and things of that nature. And President Nixon goes and signs this law into, or so, signs this bill into law just after Christmas in 1973, and nobody pays attention. In fact, so little attention, this is the cover, this is the front page of the LA Times uh, in the wake of the signing, and the president signs bill reshaping federal manpower programs. And you have to look really, really close in that red lettering, which you guys, why can't you see that? 
Wait, how come we couldn't see that? The red lettering there says, you know, all this other stuff about these other bills he signed. And then, oh, by the way, on paragraph 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, it says the Endangered Species Act gifting the government authority or giving the government authority to make easily identify, uh, to make early identification of animals threatened with ex extinctions and to act as quickly to save them, right? And then other things, right? So it wasn't even big news, right? Passed unanimously, didn't seem like a controversial thing. Of course we should do this. This makes sense. This is good governance, etc. So that is how we got the Endangered Species Act, which is probably, um, if not the most important environmental piece of environmental legislation, it's, it's absolutely one of the most important and is certainly one of the, the golden um, uh, uh, foundations of modern environmental, um, the modern environmental movement. And a lot has been, uh, has driven a lot of the creation and the um, attention of conservation biology ever since. So here's what uh, Congress said in the Endangered Species Act. It said, uh, we're going to say that uh, uh, if something is is been driven extinct as a consequence of economic growth or other development, um, we should do something about that. So despite the rhetoric that people will tell you, economic stuff is written into this bill. Um, and, uh, and these species are of value. They're of value monetarily, but they are also of intrinsic value. Um, and not only are they important, but in order to save them, and this is the real power of the Endangered Species Act, not only are they important, but the ecosystems that support these species also need to be conserved. And so this is one of the, the main ways we're able to, say, establish a protected area, establish a set-aside, save a, a parcel of forest or something, because it is home to an endangered species. We do not have an endangered forest law. We have an endangered species law. Um, and, uh, and, and yes, and so and the, it sets forward this process that we'll talk about in a second. So what does the Endangered Species Act do? Well, first and foremost, it, determ it sets forth a mechanism to determine rarity. Traditionally, this was about species. This is mostly about species. But in the decades since, we've come to apply this also to subspecies, in some cases, to populations and subspecies, and to so-called ESUs, or evolutionarily significant units, which is kind of like, what's that weird? It's legal speak. It basically means a, a, a smaller geographic um, um, unit of these critters. So for example, we manage our salmon on the West Coast by ESU. And, and our different chunks of the coast are broken up into different ESUs depending on how many rivers, et cetera, are in that area of the coast. So we have five different levels that, that are defined by the ESA of, of organism abundance. One is the species is historically abundant um, and now is starting to become rare. So this is, we're starting to get worried about this thing, right? So we're saying, okay, hey, something's up. So you, you all doing a senior thesis, if you're out here counting plants, or if you guys are gonna go work for a consulting firm or whatever, all of a sudden you notice, or maybe in the wake of a fire, you said, oh my gosh, there used to be tons of these critters here. Now after this fire, I don't see many, whatever, right? You would say, hey, federal government, um, or Fish and Wildlife Service, or whoever it is, uh, hey, so um, I think we're, there's something weird here. Or someone like me might do a more formal study collect that data, write a paper, and then give that paper to the, the agency. And this would, start, this would start to trigger people looking at it. They would start to look at it. The, pretty much mostly, mostly we're talking about the Fish, US Fish and Wildlife Service here, the federal agency. They would look at it and they'd say, ah, maybe there is a problem. Either the critter was really, really abundant and now it's rare, or it's disappearing very quickly. The numbers are crashing more and more every year, right? So they might not be rare yet, but they seem like they're on the trajectory to becoming rare. If we have justification, it would be so-called listed as a candidate species, a candidate for listing. Under the ESA, the candidate listing is treated temporarily like an endangered species. So it gets protection once it's a formal candidate. 
And a candidate doesn't mean I nominated them. It means the agency is, is currently doing studies, internal studies, to figure out if they want to list it. The next level is so-called threatened. So we have not listed at all, a candidate listing, and the next one is threatened, and then if they're even rarer, endangered, and the last level is extinct. So something can cease to be endangered either by going up that list, but by becoming only threatened, right, and becoming more abundant and sort of uh, recover, starting to recover, or it can get, get off the endangered species list by going just extinct. Those are two ways to, to leave the list. Once a species is determined to either be threatened or endangered, then the federal agency has to engage, has to create what's called a species recovery plan. This is the first place that economics are allowed to enter into the process. Up until this point, it doesn't matter if it's going to stop a gazillion million dollar dam or whatever, it, that doesn't matter. It only matters if we're going to drive this organism to extinction and lose this biological heritage from our planet. Um, and so the, the species recovery plan um, is sort of two main parts. One, it's what is, the, what is the essential habitat? What's the core habitat that we need to protect for this critter? And then once we kind of figure that out, then what are we going to do to boot, make more babies? What are we going to do to help this population grow? The Endangered Species Act also articulates penalties, <coughs> excuse me, penalties for harming these individuals. These are, the legal term for this are, is takings. So again, takings is anything that impacts the critter. It is shooting it, it is driving over it with a car, it is killing it, but it's also just flushing it, just scaring it, just changing its behavior is considered a taking in the legal sense, even if you don't physically take it and the animal's still alive and, and still stays in the area. Any disturbance is a taking. Lastly, it assigns authority for which federal agency will be the lead agency to run the assessment, et cetera, of the Data Speech Act. The default is Fish and Wildlife Service. However, if the organism at any point in its life history routinely touches salt water, then it becomes the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So that means our endangered whales, our endangered abalone, white abalone, et cetera, stuff like that. NOAA runs the process. But it also means our salmon, our anandromous salmon that start, start their life in the freshwater and they go out to the ocean for some period of their life and they come back to the freshwater. NOAA is the agency that, that is in charge of, of figuring those uh, critters out. There are many roles that biologists play in the endangered species in the process of recovering endangered species. And these are just a handful of them. And, and you guys may go and work for a consulting firm, whatever, you may do some or all these. So do a consultation history, what's going on, what's our experience with this organism in the region, um, uh, maybe describing how we might go about and, 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 and encourage the reproduction or the growth of the population, all the way, so on and so forth, all throughout um, uh, the different processes of, of understanding what's going on with this critter. That's the ESA, briefly. Then we get, so this passes and, and the environmental community is like, woohoo, great! And then we have the first big test very, very soon. It's this thing, it's the TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority. Now, this is a, a you know, rural area, area with high poverty, um, an area that uh, in the, when the Great Depression started and the, and the Tennessee Valley Authority was created, TVA was created essentially the same era as we built campus. Same idea. Great Depression, we want to help people get out of this depression and everything. So amongst other things, they start building dams because most of these folks don't have access to electricity. So we're going to generate some electricity, we're going to control flooding, all the typical classic things. So this is the last um, uh, so, so, okay, so the Tennessee Valley Authority was created in 1933. And it said, hey, you're going to go do all these public works in the greater, this greater region of the country, and it's going to give people jobs, first and foremost, so they can buy food and, and have a paycheck and stuff. It'll generate hydropower, and it'll control the floods, right? And so just like we build campus with thousands of people, 
you know, over years, same thing is going on here. And so you see one of these work camps um, right here, uh, uh, and, and FDR is visiting that particular one. So very early in the wake of this agency, this, this, this TVA, Tennessee Valley Authority, being created, um, they propose all these dams up and down the entirety of, of this, this watershed, this region of the country. And in 1940, they proposed this dam on the Little Tennessee River. Takes them a long time to get to it because they're doing all these other much more high priority dams before, before that. In fact, they don't get to announcing it until 1961, almost 20 years later. Okay? So now we're going to do it. And it takes them another several years to get going and start to build the dam. And so they start to build, they start construction in 1967. So this is really important that you hear me on this, because everybody gets the, almost everybody gets this wrong. And we'll see this time and time again. You've already seen this, but you will continue to see this over your lives. These stories get very simplified and changed. And the narrative, the story that everybody assumes is not necessarily the real story that went down. Sometimes it is, but it's not always. In this case, See up there on the map, I put all the red dots. Those are all the dams that have gone in. This is the very, very last dam. This is the last 33 miles or 53 kilometers of high quality river in the whole Tennessee Valley. Thousands of miles of rivers are dammed. This is the last bit. Um, that map on the right was generated uh, uh, when General Washington was in the French and Indian Wars, and it still worked up in the 1960s. The, the river bends and the map was still wor working. Many small farms here, many native tribes, uh, very sacred sites here, and we see this around and around and around the world. We see this in China, we see this BS happening in, in, in Turkey, where I've worked on dams, you see this in Brazil, all over, right? It's painted as a jobs thing. It is not a jobs thing. It is a screwing people over thing. It is a burying culture. It is removing people that are usually not very powerful and usually fairly poor. It is about taking stuff from some people and giving it to other people, these dams. It doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't always have to be that way. How they play out, certainly how the, the remaining dams are playing out now, that's exactly what's happening. So people will tell you that we must do these dams. Oh, we have to, da, 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 da. Um, this was a dam in search of a justification. So when this was first proposed, it was like, oh, this is going to be a jobs act. It was going to bring all these tourists in. Not going to bring any tourists in. They had to use eminent domain to take about 300 small family farms from the community there. Uh, destroy the native villages, destroy, uh, flood the native burial grounds, all this, all this kind of stuff. It's ridiculous. In addition to all that, there was huge environmental, ecological impacts. But the story becomes only about the environmental impacts and not the, the social justice and the environmental justice dimensions of this stuff as well. So this is what the Tennessee River looked like before it, the dam went up. So. The argument is, oh, we're going to do this. It's going to be great. It's going to, be, it's going to pull in all this development. We're going to have this big um, uh, uh, um, aerospace corporation is going to come in. It's going to be 50,000 homes. It's going to be this huge development. You know, complete BS. I mean, in some cases, we just have difference of opinion. These arguments were complete BS. And most of these damn arguments are complete baloney. So here you go. Here's Timber Lake City, this new town that was supposedly going to pop up here in this poor area and bring all this money and transform the lives of all these people. Um, the, T the TVA, by definition, the way it was created, it had emergency powers. So we could go ahead and do whatever it wanted to take, federal, to take private land, etc. Even with that, even with that, they had to fib and they had to lie about the economic benefits. So originally they said, hey, for every dollar that we'd spend, we'll get a dollar seventy back. Even before they built it, 
these massively inflated numbers were so inflated, even before they built it, said, well, you know, it's maybe like 30%, 30 cents return on the dollar, maybe, right? We know now it's a massive, massive money loser. So all the arguments to control flooding didn't need it. To produce power didn't need it. This, this doesn't produce any power, this dam, zero power. To bring in, to generate uh, industry didn't happen. So on and on and on. I'll, I'll, I'll rant for hours if I keep going here. Okay, so we're about to build a dam. So the dam's going forward. Construction, as I mentioned, already started. It's happening. Then we pass this law that, again, goes unnoticed on the bottom of the front page of the LA Times. People don't pay attention to it. Before they do the final flooding, some biologists, so one of the things that we will do before like a, a controlled burn or something, we'll go and just start ripping up stumps. Let's, let's see if we can find these snakes or whatever, right? Because these guys are all going to burn up in a second. So let's just go and hack. And normally when we go to sample critters, we want to be very careful, right? We don't want to disturb the environment. But in this case, this, this fast flowing water was going to become a still pond and is going to completely change. So these biologists go around just kicking over stones, grad students. Hey, let's go see, like, I like, take you guys, I take our class. Hey guys, we're gonna go out, we're just gonna nuke everything. We're gonna just see what we got, right? Because in a couple weeks, this place is gonna be dead. They're doing it and they find, and you see a little bag there in the lower left, they find this fish and like, what is this? Hey, this is a snail darter. So it turns out we find this little fish that doesn't appear at the time to be anywhere else in this watershed. So, it meets the criterion of something that's a candidate for listing. So, we, so, um, so these guys are very small, they hatch very quickly, um, they're not long-lived, they, 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 they're kind of you know, small little fish um, that live in these fast-moving waters. <clears throat> How many are there? Not entirely sure. A couple years later, 1978, we estimate somewhere between five and 20,000. Um, uh, you know, were worried that they, that they were definitely disappearing, and this was their last draw. So, we, so these biologists call up these lawyers and they say, hey, 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 we gotta list this thing super quick because they're getting ready to flood this valley. So in 1975, the Fish and Wildlife Service starts the formal petition to list this, these critters as an endangered species. The developers, guess what, don't like it. And they're like, yo, 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 no way, you're gonna, we've spent all this money, Congress gave us all this money and you're gonna stop me for some stupid fish? Are you kidding me? You can't even eat it. Like what's the point? How stupid, right? You're an idiot. And so this begins the current um, uh, a cultural separation of people on political class and all this kind of stuff over the Endangered Species Act. <clears throat> this is the thing that defines how many people think about the Endangered Species Act now. So, um, the, the, the federal agency, the, the folks that are building the dam are like, we're going forward, this is ridiculous. So they file an appeal, it goes through the courts, and it eventually gets up to the Supreme Court, <clears throat> and they say, uh, actually, we read the law, and it's the plain intent of the Endangered Species Act to save species whatever the cost. So at the time of 1978, they'd spent $78 million on this little teeny dam, which is only, only about 120 feet tall, it's a small dam. Nevertheless, they spent $78 million and they said, so we don't care. And then, they, then they, the dam advocates got really ticked off. <clears throat> so then they went and they amended the Endangered Species Act. And we created a thing that we now refer to as the God Squad. So it said, in addition to all the stuff we said, we're going to create another, essentially, appeals level within the Endangered Species Act. And there'll be some people that sit on there, and they can decide if a species can be exempted from endangered species protections. So their idea was, we're going to make our own uh, special board, and we're going to staff it with our own people, and then we're going to like, be able to go forward the dam. <clears throat> so that we make a God Squad. The God Squad rules the next year and they go, actually, no, we should probably save the species. And then they're really pissed because everything they're trying isn't working, right? They're like, what the hell? Um, and so, so then they, uh, later in 1979, they, they introduce a rider, which is a, a sort of like addition to another bill um, that basically says, hey, the Teleco Dam doesn't have to abide by the Endangered Species Act and they finished the dam, and so we thought at the time that that was it, the, the snail darter in like 1980 was gonna go extinct in the wild at least. We had some at the, you know, in some aquaria at the time, but in the wild it seemed like it was gonna go extinct. 
But that next year, we actually found another population. So another, another key thing here is check it out. 1975, we've had several years of people starting to survey. So now we're starting to look for this thing. We're starting to develop breeding technology. So we bought our, at a minimum, we've bought ourselves some time to figure out how to do a captive breeding program or something like that, right? So 1980, a new snail daughter population is found. So it's, it, it, you know, is still alive, still around. Uh, population in the wild, I should say. But this completely colors the debate from here on out. So when we next go to, for a reauthorization of the Endangered Species Act in 1982, this is on everybody's tongue. And everybody's thinking about this, and oh my God, this huge pain in the butt, oh my gosh. And it's still super influential. And the, in the um, amendments we've had since, everybody always talks about the snail darter. You'll hear it, it's quoted on Fox News all the time. It's still on people's lips, et cetera. This is what those advocates got. This is what Telecode looks like. As of 2021, which is the most recent published data uh, on, on the Tennessee Valley Authority's own website, the, there's a, the water is 129 feet deep at its deepest point, so it's not a very big dam, or not a very big thing. But check it out, this whole area behind us is now a flood of this whole valley, right? <clears throat> so it's a very flat part of the country. So even though it's only 129 feet, it, it extends widely. Um, 120,000 uh, acre feet of storage, which isn't a whole lot. The reservoir health is crap. It's fair to poor. Water quality sucks. Often has large problems with low dissolved oxygen and associated fish kills. Um, there's a, you can't just fish catfish there like other places because there's PB, uh, PCBs that have accumulated and are at, in many cases dangerous levels to eat. There is no economic stimulus. This is still a very poor part of our country. Those family farms have been flooded. Those Native American sites have been destroyed. Um, and it looks like this if you pull up to it. A bunch of garbage floating around. Here, here is the data <clears throat> for um, since 1994. And this is, I, didn't, I didn't make this. This is lifted right from the report of the agency that argued we desperately had to do this dam. So here, so the green means we have good water quality, high water quality, good. Um, gray is kind of crap. Technically, it's called fair. And then the light gray is poor. And 62.5% of the years, it falls into poor water quality. That's what we bought ourselves with this great, fantastic dam that was so important that we really had to shove it through, right? So oftentimes in our conservation discussions, where it's, a fr where it's framed as if, oh, this poor innocent family or this poor community really needs this thing. Rarely is that the case. Rarely is that the case. Good sustainable development is good for both people and the planet. And when you hear people pitting folks against each other, the hairs on the back of your neck should go up and you're like, are you sure that's really what's going on here? Okay, so, so this teleco thing, though, prefigured all the rest of the criticisms that will, would be levied at the Endangered Species Act. Um, and so this is, this is from the perspective of the supposed developer, like the, the quote-unquote stereotypical developer or supposed private property owner or whatever. So they say, oh, the Endangered Species Act is horrible because it limits new land development. Um, it makes people angry. And, um, and then in some cases, local governments get ticked off because they're thinking, hey, if we put this big, huge development in, we'll get a, bunch, a new tax base, we'll make a lot of money, and you're not letting us do that, do that development. Much of the ESA animosity, anger, energy is in the Western US because we still have a lot, relatively large amount of open space and, and, and populations and all that kind of good stuff. Um, we see it uh, in controversies related to water for farms, right? And this is going on right now with, with you know, the drought and all this kind of stuff. If you drive through the Central Valley, you'll see all these signs that say, um, you know, how dare we save water for fish, right? We need, we need this for our farms, right? So it sets up this false dichotomy that, 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 that that's the choice. Um, and then uh, in, in more interior West, people talk about it frequently with the Clive and Bundys of the world, the people that go and take over national wildlife refuges and then get let off because they are of a privileged class. 
Um, and, and they say, oh my gosh, this doesn't allow us to do ranching and, and leasing of federal lands, that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, uh, uh, left out of most of these conversations, again, are the disenfranchised communities that don't have the power that are oftentimes heavily impacted by these uh, supposed developments that are gonna go in. Um, the general criticism are things like, people hear this saying like, hey, how come, what do you mean the Endangered Species Act won't let me do whatever I want? I wanna do this on my land and, and you're taking away my private property rights. You gotta pay me for this, right? That's a red herring. You could say the exact same thing. You could say, hey, I wanted to film some child porn in my backyard, but you won't let me? Then you gotta give me money, right? We don't behave that way. We say, hey, this is something our society has decided we don't want you to do, so you can't do that. Doesn't matter if it's your private backyard or whatever, you're not allowed to do that, right? And the same thing for the protection of endangered species. But this is, this is debated rigorously in the courts, Eddie. Uh, uh, they wrote it into law. Yeah. Oh, so they, just wrote it into law. they wrote it into the federal the, the the federal law that was giving money out for that year, mm -hmm. and it said this amount of money can be built for this 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 thing is exempt from the Endangered Species Act. That that's how they did it legally. I I mean I I don't know the legal machinations how they worded it. They tried. Didn't work. Mm -hmm. They tried. I know they've taken down other dams. Is there any conversation of taking that one out, or is it one of those things? That not that I, I yeah, I, 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 not to my knowledge, perhaps, but but not to my knowledge. So the question is, uh, is, if has anybody talked about taking down those dams? No. Uh, at least not, at least not that particular one, not the Teleco Dam. Um, uh, you'll also hear it phrased as what happened to local control because supposedly the locals want to do this activity that's going to impact endangered species. Um, and then you'll often hear this argument, which is, are you kidding me? All for some stupid little fill in the blank plant, some stupid little mouse, some stupid little worm or, you know, whatever, whatever the whatever the description is. And those folks are trying to lure you into a false discussion, and it's not, it's not false. I mean, of course we should, we should have some sense of you know, the realities of economics. We don't want to be stupid and have our head in the sands. But they want to have that conversation before we determine that we should save this species, right? And so, um, and so they, and so some things like salmon are very easy to quantify the economic value. If we save this salmon species, oh, you know, people pay for it to get on their plates, and so that's something that's easily quantifiable. Then we have other things like whales that are also very easy to understand and, and easy to measure, um, but we don't, we don't really eat the whales, so it's a little bit harder to do it in a traditional economic sense, but we could talk about uh, the value of whales for um, ecotourism, right? So non-consumptive uses, we would say. And so, you know, a little bit harder, but we can sort of do an argument for that. Those are the rare exceptions. Most of the critters that we're talking about in terms of most of the biodiversity on life don't fall into one of those first two categories. Um, there's no obvious commercial value. And however you would go about put, ascribing a dollar value to it would be very complex and have a bunch of assumptions and everything. So um, it, it can be a dangerous thing to go down that road. Um, and that's why advocates of, of destroying species will want you to go down that because they know it's a hard thing to do and it's difficult to uh, do and it's easy to poke holes in. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned before, ESA is working to prevent take. And so as I said before, take means any kind of take, shooting, disturbing, what have you. And this is why people are worried because like, oh my God, now it's an endangered species. Now if I just drive across my property, if I drive across my ranch, what if I spook that bird? Now I'm going to be in trouble, right? Now I'm going to get a uh, a taking for just doing what I've always been doing, my family's been doing for decades and decades and decades, right? And so, um, uh, starting in, 19, in the 80s, we started saying, hey, um, 
uh, habitat modification may constitute a taking. So even though there's no critter right here, if you, had, if, you had, if you were essential habitat, and while let's say the bird has migrated up to Canada right now, and you came in in that intervening time and you mowed down all the vegetation, right? So you didn't disturb the, the, the bird right then, that could be considered a taking. So what we see over the, over the coming years is these, these initial ideas are fleshed out. So th some things are deepened, some things are redefined, et cetera. In 1982, we have what's called an incidental take permit. And so this is what you and I would get if we were going out and doing some surveys, we would get an incidental take permit. Not that we want to take any, any um, so let, let, let's say we have, to, we have to widen this bridge because it's gonna fall down the next earthquake. So we gotta put some wider buttresses. But in the process of doing that, we're gonna be in the water and there might be an endangered species. We would get what's called an incidental take permit that said that we're not trying to kill any of these critters, we do everything we can to minimize the kill, but, but just by happenstance, we might accidentally harm some. Uh, we have to mitigate for that, we have to make more fish or whatever it is, but the point is you can get an incidental take permit so you don't, like, the person doing the footing of the bridge doesn't go to jail. Um, and I'm just gonna skip over this for time. Um, uh, yeah, and I think I'll just skip over this because uh, uh, so I'll say if to get an incidental take permit, which is really, really key for a lot of our man conservation management efforts, as well as some of our ongoing uh, disaster response efforts and things of that nature, to get an incidental take permit, you have to first get what's called a biological opinion, which is another place you guys might weigh in on, on this. And so this says that, yeah, okay, if we put this in and these guys are going to do the bridge development for like whatever, three months, they're probably going to kill, I don't know. 200 fish or something at the most, that's not going to be a, a lethal hit to the population. And so if that's the case, then, then uh, we would have to do all these actions to minimize the take, but we, we, could, get, we could get an incidental take permit. Okay. Okay, so this is where we are as of uh, this week, basically. So you can look at the numbers. Don't worry about the colors. Uh, I, I didn't have time to double check all the colors, but, but the numbers are all accurate as of today. These are the number of federally uh, species listed on the Endangered Species Act in all these different states, right? So what, what pattern do you see? Where are the most endangered species or, or, or threatened species or whatever? Where are the most listed species? Hawaii. Where, 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 what's after Hawaii? Okay, why are these two places, why, why are there so many endangered species or threatened or whatever species there? Uh, so one, that, one, they're very biodiverse, right? So they have a lot, they have a, they have, there's a high concentration of, there's a high species richness there, just general. High degree of endemism, meaning they're only found in California or only found in Hawaii. Why else? Right. Right, so there's, there's a high amount of disturbance, a high amount of transformation of the ecosystems that are there by uh, direct or indirect human activities there. Um, Alaska only has eight, because ain't nobody there, right? There's not much disturbance going on there, br broadly speaking. Like, yep. uh, like values and like the politics of how they run the state? Partly, partly, but mostly this is gonna be because of the underlying just outright diversity and the outright threats and conversion. Um, I mean, if we look on the East Coast, there of course was, was a lot of endemism on the East Coast, but that stuff's all been plowed under, right? So there's, just, there's not that much left back there of relatively pristine ecosystems and stuff. Could public awareness also be driving? Public awareness could, but um, I mean, there's definitely, having worked in Louisiana all these years, there's definitely a difference of opinion of how we approach these kinds of things as opposed to our friends down there, but, but so there's a little bit of that's going on, but it's mostly not that. It's mostly just the diversity and stuff underlying stuff. Okay, so this is the U.S. Here is, uh, here is um, what we're talking about. So we have animals, plants, lichens, because lichens are part plant, part fungus, but that's it. And these animals so far in this list are all vertebrates. Oh, that's not entirely true. I guess we have a, there's, there's a marine invertebrate on there. But there are no insects. 
Well, I shouldn't say that either. I shouldn't say that either. Um, yeah, I'll leave. I'll leave. I'll. I'll hold on. I'll. I'll. I'll pause that comment. Um, okay. So. So endangered, threatened, total listings, and then have a look on the right. This is how many of those species have a recovery plan. The lichens, we're doing great with the lichens. Got about 100% of those folks have a recovery plan. Plants, of the plants that are listed, uh, a, a high degree have, have recovery plans, but only about 79% of the animals have a recovery plan. Here's where we are in California. So I've broken down by plants and animals. Now have a look, there's a new category. And so we have our own California Endangered Species Act and other states have their own versions of their own statewide species, um, Endangered Species Act. We have another category in California. We have what's called rarity or rare. So that only applies to plants. So that's a category only for plants and only at the state level. Um, so what do we, what do we have uh, most of? Um, endangered, threatened, or rare things? Endangered, endangered is, the lar is the most uh, numerically uh, common category. Uh, certainly in terms of plants, but also in terms of animals. And here's Ventura County. So Ventura County, um, you know, obviously there's fewer things we're getting local or more and more local we're getting fewer and fewer things. Um, but, uh, you know, we have, we have our uh, individuals as well. This is, this is as of 2018. So let's talk about this as a conservation tool. This is now uh, CITE, or this is, this is the, the IUCN's um, red list, which is, is sort of analogous to the ESA, but it has broader uh, division of categories and is a bit more um, uh, scientifically robust in, in some cases. Um, but this is, so this is what we have for worldwide listing. This dark uh, line here is how many species we've actually looked at quantitatively. One of the big problems is if we don't know how many critters are here, we don't know and then we can't, we, we can't say if it's endangered or not, right? So we have to first be able to do an assessment. So this first one is just have we done an assessment? And this red one is uh, critters that are essentially of concern. Uh, this, this category is threatened, but this would, this, would, this would be the equivalent of getting on the endangered species list. Um, and so what's the pattern you see? And this goes up to 2022. 